<laughs> oh, can you write something on the back? Just uh, so okay. can, like um, my nickname is Just Universe because I'm kind of into it. Just write right on top of this. If, if you want. Just Universe. Yes, that's my new nickname. Uh, J E S S. Yeah, just J E S S. The Universe after. Just and the Universe. Oh no, Just Universe continues. Universe. <laughs> okay. They're not gonna be able to read it. But. Right. Thank you so it's much, a sir. Pleasure, sir. <laughs> mm.
Hi. So, a guy called me about six months ago, and uh, he said, uh, we'd like you to make a, a country music album. And I said, whoa. Uh, no, Henry Winkler says, whoa. I don't say whoa. I said, yes. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I uh, arranged uh, for him to send me songs, pick the songs out, and something unusual happened, at least for me. And I thought, just to start our afternoon off, I'd tell you about this unusual experience I had making, <clears throat> making a country music album. Something wrong with the mic, it's not my voice. Um, making a country music album. So, I start the story off long time ago uh, in, a, in a galaxy far, far away. That's the wrong show. Um, on Times Square, in Times Square, actually on Times Square, there was a, a building called the Brill Building. And in the Brill Building, they had composers playing in every office, composing songs for the artists of the time. And the artists of the time were Al Jolson and, and Eddie Cantor and, uh, and latter-day Frank Sinatra, the old-time singers, the crooners, the vaudeville singers, and the Brill Building was filled with creative people who would, at the piano, would be creating songs, and they'd be creating songs for a named performer or a, uh, somebody who wanted to put an act together, and they would go up and say, what do you got? And the guy, the guy would play the song and, and sing the song. And then the actor, the, the, the singer, might uh, say, I'll, I'll take that song. And there'd be an exchange of money. And the guy bought a song, and then it became you know, part of what he was doing, an album or a, a record or a single or a part of an act. So there was like a, a, a uh, somebody, there's somebody behind me. Is there somebody behind me? No. What was the noise I heard? It's a camera. It was either somebody was coming to kill me <laughs> or somebody was passing gas. I'm not quite sure. So, so uh, the, the Brill Building and the composers and the exchange between performers and the creative songwriters. Well, the Brill Building no longer exists. I'm sure it's still there, but it no longer exists as the fountainhead of all these classic hit songs that were became American songs. It went to Nashville and became country music. And the country music people have, I, I don't think they're in one building, I think they're scattered around, but in a central area where they write songs for the country music artists who come up and say, what do you got? And they, and they play and sing a song. So when Brian Curl of Heartland uh, Records asked me to do an album. I said, well, what am I gonna sing? He said, we'll send you songs. And I began to receive on the phone incredible new, <laughs> all the new uh, technology that allows you to do everything so efficiently. He would send me songs and I would listen to the song and I would say, I like that, I don't like that. And I chose, eventually chose uh, along uh, 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 with uh, uh, Jack Kent of, of uh, 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 Alabama, the group Al Alabama, Jack Cook of, uh, Al uh, uh, of the group Alabama, he and I were doing the, uh, the album. And I chose, along with him, 12 songs. So I had the recording of the 12 songs in my phone that I had chosen, and we all agreed these were the great songs. And for about a month, I'd listen to them 
on the phone day after day. The guy who had written the song, usually, I think, maybe completely of the 12 songs, 12 performers were doing, the, the, the composer was performing the song who himself or herself was a great performer. They had, just didn't have the luck of having the publicity, but they were wonderful singers and the way they phrased their music. And I listened to it and I listened to it. And then I had to be in Germany for an appearance and I was performing in Germany for two days. I flew to Nashville on a Monday night. I got there about midnight and Brian Curl, the producer, took me to uh, uh, Cook's mansion uh, outside of Nashville. Uh, he had a castle, he had built a castle. I was lodged in the castle. I got there about one o'clock Tuesday morning. 10 o'clock Tuesday uh, morning, I was in front of a microphone at Cook's uh, studio, which was attached to the house. And because I knew the songs so well, I was able to lay down my tracks in one day, from Tuesday at 10 o'clock to about 6 in the evening. I did all 12 songs because I knew them as though I had been doing them for a month. Now, Brian and company now take the song, my, my track and do orchestrations around what I had done. And then they sent them to me finally. The record is coming out in the next two weeks. It's already getting... I'll leave it up to you if you should uh, so wish to tell me what you think of it, but already it's sensational. And on top of that, I, before that, I had uh, laid down some tracks for a Christmas album that'll be out in October. So I've got two albums coming out, but this country album is like like a baby. Like here I am, here it is. What do you think? And that's what it's like. Opening night uh, happening now. So that's what's happening to me. Okay, you got it. Why are you standing way back there, the microphone person? Why don't you put the mic? I have been around a long time, if that's another uh, sort of oblique way of saying you've been here forever. Uh, In a good way. How, how can you st stand up at this point? <laughs> and, and you may notice I'm sitting down. <laughs> um, well, I started off as a youngster. I was very young when I started and just did things and and things came my way eventually with a lot of work and a lot of being there and, uh, and trying to do my best and gradually uh, uh, made it from Canada to uh, New York and then New York to Los Angeles to Hollywood and back to Broadway and then touring and then I began to get the idea that I, I had been doing musicals in college and I really loved the way I wanted to sing so badly. What I've done is sing badly. <laughs> I'll have to remember that. That was not bad. It was <laughs> and, uh, and, and so I realized, you know, I, I, I had taken singing lessons uh, when I was quite young, and I didn't follow through. I know you can learn. The vocal muscles can be trained, and the most miraculous thing for me vocally are opera and the opera singers, male and female. They've taken the human voice to a level that is miraculous uh, in what the, the notes and the range that they can, uh, they can uh, uh, reach. Uh, I have on my phone an app uh, which gives us bird sound. Uh, the birds of America. It's really interesting to play what these various birds sound like. And some of them, a hoot owl, an owl, no, the great gray owl has a variety of sounds. The likes of which, what, what are you laughing? It's incredible. The owl sounds incredibly. Uh, and, and elephants can send sounds thousand miles underground and whales sing and, and so the, the animal world is alive with sound but no species makes 
the range and the emotion that human beings can do, and especially opera trained singers. Crooners and, and natural singers are, are wonderful and they, and they, uh, they do so well in, in conveying emotion and, and sense. But that opera and the human voice, so I've always envied that. And I came upon the, the ability to do the poetry of the lyric. So I began to do that and have made some music and I'm making more. But I've envied the musical part of that. So I, I lurched into music and then uh, I was always at directing and I was always directing <laughs> even when I wa wasn't a director, I was <laughs> directing badly. <laughs> so all of this became kind of a part of what I did, writing, directing, acting, music, uh, and then I began to find myself willowing, winnowing into businesses that did that sort of thing, like virtual reality business. Uh, so I would, became interested in the magic, what's happening. You know that uh, the technology uh, for entertainment has gone crazy. I mean, there'll come a time, if it's not already, where we are totally entertained. I'm watching the Wind Wimbledon on my phone. I mean, live television on my phone. You know, the Roman circuses were laid out to amuse the public and keep their mind off of what was going on politically in the, in. <laughs> now somebody is passing air. <laughs> That's not a camera, folks. Uh, so, the Roman circuses were designed to amuse the public, to keep the minds off of what was happening in Rome at the time. And the, the more things went bad in Rome, the more extravagant the circuses became. They began to flood the arena with water and have naval battles, for God's sake, let alone lions attacking uh, human beings. So are we reaching that stage where, <laughs> you know, don't think about the politics of what's happening. L look at uh, your phone and be amused. But virtual reality, so the company came to me and said, would I be part of the company of this virtual uh, uh, visa, uh, Ziva it's called, Z-I-V-A, the virtual reality company. And they played for me uh, with, the, with the goggles on part of what they were designing. And it's so real, you cannot tell the difference between the reality and the, and the image on the, in, in, the, uh, in, in the glasses. Uh, it, it could be psychologically damaging if it's like a nightmare, which this was. In addition to that, in addition to that, I went to JPL, and they are using the same technology, uh, three-dimensional footage. They allowed me to to presume to. I'm sitting in a chair, or walking. I'm walking on the moon. I was there on the moon with virtual reality, and that's here. It isn't even around the corner. It's around the corner for mass production. But it's happening right now. I mean, there's an explosion in electronics. And when you think of the magic of, of uh, the art, of, of uh, computer art, com computer graphic art, is gone from the Star Trek I was in, you know, almost laughable, or a guy in a wig, uh, in, a, in a fluffy suit, pretending to to be standing on a wing of a 500 mile an hour uh, jetliner and you have to uh, suspend disbelief. That was what? I know it was Twilight Zone. <laughs> He's telling me that was Twilight Zone. I know that was Twilight Zone. When I can't remember, I'll ask you. <laughs> which will be any moment now, I mean, But the magic 
that we didn't have that J.J. Abrams has discovered uh, for use in Star Trek has broken the the uh, economic barriers of the movies that I was in would make a certain amount of money, like $100 million. Now, it's in the stratosphere of the money that, the, that Star Trek movies are making because of the magic of, of uh, computer graphics. So, and I'm involved in that. So, it's a matter of being healthy, being curious, and having the the ability to look into what it is you're curious about, no matter what the career part of it is. Thank you. That's a rather extensive answer to a very simple question. Hello. Hi there. Uh, my name is Emilio. Hello, Emilio. And uh, I know you got like a new. Uh, you know, some new music coming out. And new music that. coming out. Yeah. Christmas album, too. <laughs> uh, and, and it's weird. It's a strange band uh, on Christmas songs. Really a little offbeat. It's really good. I'm sort of like, here's my baby. And I got another baby. I got twins coming out. And a book. And a book. And a book. Somewhere in between. Uh, live long and dot, dot, dot. If we don't know. <laughs> the rest is up yeah. to you. What's like, what are some of your favorite uh, genres of music? You know? What are my favorite genres of music? Yeah, like what do you listen to? <laughs> hip-hop. Um, no. <laughs> Not hip-hop. Um, I, I find myself listening to a lot of country music. I really admire country music. Uh, that, that's where the single performers are now. Uh, I love show music. Uh, the great Broadway musicals have always been my favorite, and I, I sort of love to listen to that. Uh, classical music has got a very important place. And I, I wasn't brought up, my, my home when I was growing up did not have a lot of music in it. My dad used to come home at the end of the week, he'd work Saturday mornings, and Saturday afternoon he'd rest up by listening to the opera. He'd lie down, in a room, on a cot, and he'd listen on the radio. You remember radio? <laughs> he'd listen on the radio to, uh, to, the, the, to the New York uh, Opera Company, uh, which they had on every Saturday afternoon. Uh, I guess that's where my acquaintanceship with opera and classical music came from. But that's where he would rest for a couple of hours, and then he'd get up and do family things. Um, so I was not brought up with music in the house. It was interesting. And then I came to music uh, in with uh, rock and roll and, and, uh, and country music, yeah. I'm a huge fan of rock and roll, so. Yeah. Black Sabbath tea on, so. Yeah, I see the Black Sabbath. And I've gotten to know, um, 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 uh, uh, yeah. Remind me. Now, now's your time. <laughs> uh, Black Sabbath. Ozzy. 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 I don't know what she said, but I'm not thinking. No, I don't know from that. I know Ozzy. Hey, Bill. I'm just uh, what are you doing? Uh, it's good, man. I don't... He's, he's, he's great. I, I, I tried to do uh, a number on an album with uh, that, that Ozzy sang, Black Sabbath sang. What was the name of the number I did? Nobody knew the record, I guess. Okay, yes, you good? Yeah. I'm good. Why are you standing way back there, honey? No, you. Come on, move the line up. Goodness me. Hello, sir. Hello, dear. Uh, my name is Sierra. 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 Um, so my question is a follow-up to his. Uh, I wanted to know, because I like to download music, I obviously I buy my music, I, I don't, it's not illegal, okay? Uh, anyway, so I like to buy music from, um, you know, Google Play, just, just to get James Bader, um, the writer, um, David E. Kelly. So, yeah, listen, all these names I have to come up with, and I've only got one guy to work with. So, Kelly is like 
a genius writer, and he wrote, uh, he wrote uh, Ali McBeal and The Practice, for example. Uh, in those days, they were they did 24 shows. Now they're doing eight, ten, twelve. He wrote, he, he wrote 24 shows. They did 24 shows for each, so that's 48 shows. He wrote all 48. This is one year, several years ago. And he won an, an Emmy for comedy and an Emmy for drama in the same year, and he wrote all the shows. That's the guy who wrote uh, Boston Legal. And when we knew that we were being canceled, he tried to sum it all up by, by taking the two uh, uh, characters, uh, uh, James Spader and myself, and, and for tax reasons only, <laughs> sorry, um, married them. And so the last scene was my uh, uh, dancing with James Spader. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. And, and the question is, now that the show's canceled, did those two characters stay together? And, and the same way I speculated, after Captain Kirk was killed in the movies, they gave me permission to write novels as though Captain Kirk continued to live. And I put my own life and the things that were happening to me into Captain Kirk's life and did a kind of autobiographical fiction on the subsequent novels about Star Trek. I think that couple still exists and, uh, and they've fallen in love. I would love to see an autobiography of Denny Craig. Yeah, uh, right. It's good to you. Thank you. Thank you. You're the dude. No, that the Abidis is the dude. The, the dude abides. Uh, I'm a shatter. My name is Danny. And Danny, how are you? Very well, thank you. Good. By the way, you know, I grew up as an Air Force brat, and Star Trek was one of the things that grounded me whenever we moved from place to place. So thank you. How wonderful. So, uh, um, one of your most, to me, one of your most iconic moments is uh, is the Get a Life segment yeah. on SNL. And I'm wondering if you recall how... How, how wonderful of you to bring that up in front of a <laughs> conventional audience to get a life. You know, Mr. Shatner, always make an impact, right? Uh, always make an impact? Always make an impact. So I'm wondering if you recall how long it took the writers of SNL to convince you to do that skit, and what was the... I'm curious as what the response of fandom was at the time. You know what's strange to me is how... I mean, that was done so many years ago. And it's continually brought up that sketch of get a life, and I, I, I wow, that's a that longevity for a, a sketch on Saturday Night Live uh, is is kind of special. So they wrote a sketch, uh, Saturday Night Saturday Night Live did, in which I'm at a convention, and people are asking me questions about how Captain Kirk lived. You know, what's Captain Kirk's favorite color? Uh, I don't know. And uh, then, and I finish it off with, you know, get a life. And what I, what the, 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 the comedy, the comedy behind get a life, it was obviously I was having fun with, if I were to say to you, hey, dude, get a life. It, it would, it, it, it was not meant in the farthest reaches of my imagination, a condemnation. It was fun, it was joking, because I'm as much involved in Star Trek uh, more than anybody else here. Well, maybe not anybody else. Really. <laughs> um, but, but I'm involved. And, and so Get a Life was meant for fun. And I thought of it as fun. And I got very little kickback on it. Although I understand that the Roddenberry office uh, looked askance added a bit. Uh, there were some sideway glances, but, you know, that was years ago, and we're still here. And uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your fanboys. Uh, the fanboy thing. Well. You know, I'm looking at a great fan right now. I mean, this is one of the, this is perhaps the greatest fan of all. Would you bring, would you, yes, bring, it's a wonderful makeup, 
and he's doing he's doing it so well. Uh, can you come up on the stage? Come up on the stage. This guy is famous for looking like an animal. No, seriously, he's the same Czechoslovakian acrobat who was standing on the wing of that airplane, and 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 now he's he's about he's playing a dog, and his name is Czech Inovovich, and he hi Czech, how are you, man? Good to see you. Hey Chuck, how are you? Come on over here, Chuck. Chuck, take the head take the head off now. Chuck, come on, take the head off. Uh, sit down, Chuck. Okay, good boy. Chuck, take the head off. Take your tongue out. Stop, Chuck, stop slobbering and take the head off. Hi, hey, sweetheart. Thank you. He's a stage dog. I tell you, once you taste it, you never want to quit. That's great. That's fantastic. Thanks. Good, sir. Good evening, Captain. <laughs> Get a life. Say it again. What? From one leader to another leader, yeah. what would you say to the country? To the country? America? To the leader of the country. Oh, well, I, 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 I'm a Canadian, you know that, right? I know. And, and, and I'm, I'm living here for longer than anybody who's alive in this audience. I've been living here on a green card. I don't want it taken away, man. I love it here. So, but let me put it this way. I was, I, I was in Canada until I was, uh, I, I graduated uh, from McGill, and then I went three years to Stratford, Ontario, a classical company, and then I came down here, and so since the time I was less than 25, I've been living in the United States, okay? While I was in Canada, so many things happened across the border. Uh, the, the, the witch hunt for communism and, and uh, the World War II and, and the Nazi thing, everything. As bad as some people think it is now, it was, it's been bad. There are bad things happening in a democracy all the time. And this democracy survives everything because of the strength of the country and the people. So whatever your politics are, things this country always survives and gets better, no matter what it is. And it'll happen to be better. Have faith in America. Young man, do you know what we're talking about? Yes, I really do. <laughs> you really do. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. In season two, episode 15 of Star Trek, or Trouble with Tribbles, yeah. how many times did you have to redo the scene where you were buried with Tribbles without laughing? Well, that was preceded by, by uh, in season two by episode 14, right? And postseded by episode 16, right? So I, I remember that vividly. Because it was only 50 years ago, and I've got it. Even though he doesn't realize that I got it still here. So there was seven and a half times that they had to do it. And on the eighth time, it was, I only smiled slightly. I have no bloody idea. But it was a funny scene. And I, what I do remember was there was a guy, a stagehand, with a triple in his hand, who must have played for the baseball team. Because just before they yelled, cut, he threw that thing and he hit me on the head. I got hit on the head with a triple, okay? And until you've been hit on the head with a triple, you haven't felt pain. You think a toothache is bad? And you think a kick in the groin is bad? Triple on the head. Um, one no more arms. Sorry. One more question. Huh. That girl stood there. 
and said, you have one question, and you want two questions because you're young and stalwart. Sorry. No, don't be. Ask your question. What did you feel like when you yelled Khan in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan? The same feeling I had when that guy threw the triple. <laughs> Extreme pain. I was active. Okay? I called Khan like... <laughs> Do it! These bird sounds I've got to play for you one day. A bird calling for its mate sounds just as bad as Khan, you know? That's what I was feeling. You good? Yes, thank you. have you. a third question, I can see it. No, I okay, good. <laughs> Hello, dear. Good, you? You look great. I'm great. I've um, been crushing on you for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> Better late than never. Better late than never. It's a great show. Brings a tremendous amount of joy and laughter into our home. Thank you. I was wondering. What a what a imagine sitting here and this lovely lady says you bring joy and laughter into my home. I get how that warms my heart. That's incredible. That's the that's the most wonderful thing that could be said. My pleasure. Um, so can you give us uh, an idea how you came to be involved with the project and can and what are the prospects for a season three? Season three is uh, trembling on the edge, but there are other there are countries that want us to come pay uh, to the show pay money for us to come and there are sponsors and networks that want the show so uh, we'll know by August 4th what the network is going to decide. So I don't know what, what we'll do. Um, I'm sitting, I have an office uh, in Los Angeles and there's some windows right there where people walk back to go into the building. But anybody goes by, I can see going by. So one day I'm sitting in my office working and leaving was, is that Henry Winkler? That was Henry? I dash out the door, Henry! And he comes back in. I said, what are you doing here? He says, well, I was just auditioning. I said, Henry, you, you're auditioning? Why are you auditioning? So I held him in my arms. <laughs> <laughs> Kissed him gently on the forehead. And said, you can't possibly give a lousy audition. You're such a talented actor. So that resonated. Uh, and Henry was asked by NBC to executive produce uh, a show that had played in Korea called, in English, No Flowers or Flowers for my grandfather. Some strange Korean name that doesn't translate very well. And they were going to do the show, but some older guys who have one last chance at life. And and Henry, executive producers usually don't do anything. They, they uh, usually just collect a small check. And they've been made executive producers for one reason or another. Uh, but Henry did some work and he said, Shatner, what about Shatner? And they said, oh, no. <laughs> and he insisted. Uh, anyway, my name was brought up as he had to sketch Shatner. So, he came, I was the next one. So there was Henry, and there was me, and then they went after the others. So when they asked me to do this, and I said, what do you do? Well, we're gonna go off into, the first thing will be Asia. We're gonna go into Asia and spend a month in Asia with Terry Bradshaw, George Foreman, and I'm a real uh, sport aficionado. I love heavyweight fights. I love football. I, I love, I played it, I boxed it. I, uh, all those things I've done in an amateurish way, and to see the top professionals do it is incredible. So when they mentioned those names as well, what a team we've got. What a great, I've always wanted to meet those guys. I mean, George Foreman is two-time 
heavyweight champion of the world. George Foreman was brought up on the streets. We went to a restaurant somewhere in Asia where the secret ingredient, and they said, you know, the secret ingredient, we're eating it, and, and everybody's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, this is rather good. And I said, you know, this tastes like dirt. <laughs> and they said, you're right, it's dirt. They had a special dirt that they had brought up, and George Foreman kept eating it. You know why? His mother brought him up because they didn't have anything at the home. They'd serve dirt to eat at times around the, 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 the table. So this guy, this giant, strong man, grows up with real rage, and he turns to boxing, and he wants to hurt people, and he hurts people, and they drop, and he wins the Golden Globe, a uh, good Golden Globes. Um, <laughs> It's slightly different from the Golden Gloves. And he wins the Golden Gloves. And, and he turns professional. And almost immediately he becomes the heavyweight champion of the world. And he's 30, and he's, uh, uh, and, he's, and he's a champion of the world, and he gets beaten. And then now he's lying on a gurney in the, in the uh, dressing room. And he feels God enter his body and he changes at that moment in time getting beaten the way he was suddenly this killer changes for the next 10 years he begins to preach he doesn't box anymore and he told me one day he looked around the table at his 12 Georges he's named all his children George and I said how do they know when to come he says they know uh, Bill, they know when I say George, or I say George, they know who I'm in the cup. They're all sitting around the table, the 12 kids, and they're all going, eat, want to eat. So I had to go make money to feed my children. He returns back to boxing and wins the championship again, and this time without the anger, this time with the science. What an interesting man, and as he is the others are so interesting. So the show lived on the relationships that we began to have, and and I had, I was so grateful to be part of that show and to get to know those people and visit those sites, those countries. Thank you. Hello there. How are you? Are you my memory? Were you the one that said, S -s hang around, I'm gonna really need you. I'm all in. You're all in, okay, good. Okay, so I'll give you a choice, entertainment or non-entertainment question. Entertainment, I have my choice. One, entertainment, two, non-entertainment. Is there a third choice? <laughs> how, about, how about entertainment that went bad? So that's non-entertainment, but it's an entertainment question. <laughs> there is a dilemma for you. There is a philosophical question. When is entertainment entertainment if you're not being entertained? If you're at a show and you're not being entertained and you want your money back, have you been entertained? Or if you're at a fiasco and you're laughing at how bad it is, have you got your entertainment's worth? It's a real dilemma, man. You keep here asking me a question and I'm posing it to you. What do you want to hear? I'm all out. <laughs> you were all in just a moment ago. You're very changeable. I want you to set your mind. Are you in or are you out? You'll never play poker with me, I'll tell you. <laughs> You're in. Ask me. So, if you could be anything outside the entertainment industry, what would you have been? What would I have been if I was anything outside the industry? You know, my mind just, like, like launched. Like an impression. Okay? So the impression, I, I, I've associated, I've turned this way a lot. Hi guys, how are you out there? <laughs> so, uh, you're so welcome. 
A three-quarter prof profile away is not bad. Um, so my mind, I just jumped on you like, what would you do? <laughs> you look so much like the guy back there, it's incredible. Are uh, you twins? Oh, I see, you're well, there, that's great. Toughness. Um, I did a show a while ago involving uh, physicists who study the cosmos, cosmologists. That is so That is so cute. I can't get a life. Holy cats, look at the large group of people. I'll never get to all those questions. So there are a group of scientists who study the cosmos, the universe. And they're working in an area that is so science fiction that many times they get their cues from science fiction writers. And science fiction writers get their cues from this advanced, tech, advanced science where the peak of my, of the particular career, aspect of my career that I really love is talking to people and, and interviewing them. I did a show called Raw Nerve for three seasons and I interviewed a lot of people and got a lot of information and I got sort of have a knack for it. And so I did a show in which I was asked to interview a number of uh, cosmologists, I don't know the proper term, uh, ending up with Dr. Stephen Hawking. I got maybe the last interview with Dr. Stephen Hawking and he imagined dark holes, black holes, that like a whirlpool in water, that energy that surrounds the universe can have little whirlpools and things go down the whirlpools. Now, a whirlpool in our toilet goes down to the sewage plant. We know where that goes. And a whirlpool in a river Suck, can suck you down, drown you, but eventually down at the bottom, it expels whatever it is it's caught. Where does the energy from a whirlpool in the, in the universe, where does that go? And what is it? So he proposed that the energy whirling down had an event horizon, the very rim of it, where you could possibly escape or you don't escape. And if you were human and got caught, it would suck you down and it would first start with your feet, if you were going feet down, and then pull your body apart. The energy, the gravity of that would pull your body. So the last thing to disappear would be, oh my God, I'm, and you're gone. Not quite, but you get the idea. But he was just working on theory. He would see through a, he was told, I guess, through a telescope that the energy was whirling, and he supposed this. It was a, 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 a novel idea. And then he said, no information comes out of the bottom of the whirlpool. And then five years later he said, Nah, information does come out. Working totally in theory, working totally like a, a science fiction writer, thinking, what else can I imagine? I had a ferocious argument with Neil deGrasse Tyson, okay? It was just a pretend argument because he's brilliant and I know nothing. <laughs> and he and I both knew that. <laughs> How can you make a scientific observation when 95% of what you're looking at, you don't know what it is? The universe is being torn apart. It should be coming together with the force of gravity, one of the laws of 
what we think are the laws of nature. It's expanding. Where's it going? Neil, how can you say this something exists when you don't know 95% is black, is clouded? Energy, dark energy, dark, dark matter. He gave me some answer. <laughs> right. So, the place I would end up being so fascinated by the awe and the mystery of space would be, I, I would have joined hands with Dr. Stephen Hawking and never left his side. Okay? Thank you. Uh, who are you supposed to be, Tiggy Bear? Into the microphone, right in. I'm, I'm, my name is Paul, I'm dressed up as Tigger, and this, and this I, I didn't understand a word, right into the microphone. Oh yeah, well, my name is Paul, I'm dressed up as Tigger, and this is okay. Ted from the Oh, Ted from the, 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 the movie. Although he's just as many of the Does he speak? Yeah, he does, but it's very vulgar, I shouldn't press the palm. No, there are kids here. Right, exactly, and, but he could just easily be an expendable red shirt crew member in Enterprise. <laughs> he's wearing a red shirt, so he's expendable. Ted! is an expendable member of the Star Trek crew. That's how you've got this whole related. The Ted movie and Star Trek. <laughs> anyway, my question is... But you're, but you're a tiger. <laughs> What's that tiger. significance of your tiger suit? No, I just... Either way, it can be Tigger and... Tigger? Yes. Anyway, my question is, Mr. Shatner... Mr. Shatner, <laughs> yes. you've worked uh, with animals throughout your acting career. I have. Such uh, films as uh, A Whale of a Tail and Kingdom of the Spiders. Yeah. In real life, you're a horse yeah. owner. Uh, what have been your most memorable experiences working with animals, uh, both good and bad, in your uh, acting career and in life in general? Well, I worked with a tiger, <laughs> a real life tiger. Guy held it with a chain, a collar and a chain. And the tiger runs. 500 pounds, the guy was like 150, <laughs> and he was walking the tiger on a chain, and I'm supposed to be in the scene with the tiger, and I'm wondering, if the tiger moved this way, would, if he yanked the chain, would the tiger say, oh, all right, I won't bite him, yeah, what do you want? I figured, no, he wouldn't, man. So I was with great apprehension. Why are you filming me? You're not supposed to. Um, the tiger really made me think twice. I had to act with a bear um, in a movie I did with Yul Brynner. And I had just seen footage of a bear. The bear was seated in a television show. Maybe you've seen this footage, where the bear turns around, the person's talking on the microphone, and the bear bites, bear hugs and bites the interviewer. I'm thinking, I don't want to be in this same room as this bear. But perhaps the most dramatic moment for me was uh, in California. There was a, there was a, there was a. Uh, an environmental group who wanted some publicity and um, and they said we've got permission for you to go up to uh, uh, a uh, a uh, camp a, a, a live animal park north of San Francisco and you can s swim with the orcas and I said wow I'd love to do that so we're driving up to San Francisco and I'm reading the newspaper in which it says a trainer in San Diego has just been drowned by the orca that she was training. The orca kept bringing her down and she'd be let up and then she'd bring her down and drown uh, the, uh, the trainer. Subsequent to that, I've read several books on orcas and, and dolphins and things. And the orcas are, there's no telling how intelligent they are. There's no telling 
what they, how they think and what they think, we know they do. There's no telling how disseminating it must be for a pelagic animal, meaning they roam the seas in pods and eat whatever it is they eat. So sometimes they eat salmon, sometimes they eat seals, depending on where they are around the island. What it must be like for them to be incarcerated in a pool the size of, not even the size of this room. And how angry it must get. And what anger is being shown by pulling and then releasing, and then pulling, and then releasing an intelligent being. I now arrive at the park and I'm sitting on the edge of the platform and the animals are swimming there and the, the, the guy, the head of the park, the head of the orca thing is saying, all right, uh, here, here's what we're gonna do, Bill. I want you to sit on the edge there and hold your hands like this. The orca will put his head up there. I want you to step on the fins. Hold on to the orca's head. And the orca will dance with you. <laughs> now, Bill. Now, Bill. Listen to me very carefully. When I blow the whistle, Swim as fast as you can. <laughs> get to the side. Get up over here. Don't pause when I blow the whistle. And I'm thinking, what am I doing? <laughs> I don't like the sound of his voice. Why is he whispering? Is the orchid going to hear him? i got to do this. And I sit on the edge. The orca pokes its head up there. I step on the fins, and now the orca's dancing. I'm dancing with an orca! I hear the whistle. I release, and I swim as fast as I can to the, to the dock. I get up, and the orca is eating a fish, and I'm safe. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's been a, it's been a pleasure being with you. Thank Thanks, you so much. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Mr. Shatner. Signings have been moved up to 445. <coughs> You've been moved up to 445, sir, due to travel. <laughs>